Welcome to lesson three of the VHDL tutorial. Today we're going to talk about for loops, but in order to talk about for loops we need to discuss three things that are going to be related to them, and those are variables, which are instantaneous assignments that you can make within Cordis, uh, signals, which are more persistent, and we'll also talk about attributes, which can be used to access things on the byte order. Um, also we're going to talk a little bit about finite state machines. This is something that will be covered more in depth in class. And finally, let's make a bit counter. That's right people, today we're going to do something that's semi-useful. Alright, so let's begin. Um, before we begin, uh, I need to talk to you just a little bit about um, the way that a clock works in a system. So basically, you have a waveform and it comes in like this. High to low, low to high, high to low, all of that. And in a computer system, uh, you have the ability to actually know which one of these you're on. So, for instance, you might be here, or you might be here. This is a high transition, this is a low transition. But either one of these can be used to clock a system. This edge right here is called the rising edge because it rises up. This edge right here is called the falling edge because it falls back down to our low value. Why is this useful? Well, when we go to see the VHDL, what you're going to see is there's two different ways that you can clock it. You can say, I want to pay attention to the events that are happening on this signal, um, and I want to pay attention to when it goes high, or I want to pay attention to when it goes low. Uh, in terms of design, it makes a little bit of difference um, as to how your system performs, uh, how it behaves. In other words, um, when you're looking at the actual uh, waveform of it, most people clock on the rising edge, but in some cases, like when memory needs to perform faster, um, you'll see it also clocked on the falling edge too. So that's uh, one of our major concerns and uh, then also we need to talk a little bit about finite state machines. What on earth is a finite state machine? Well they're all around us. I guarantee you you've used one almost every day. In fact every time that you go down to a pop machine that's a finite state machine. In other words it has a it's a machine that has several states that it can be in pretty self-explanatory I know so we'll call this the start and the awesome MS paint skills that I have here will not allow me to write very well so I'll try not to do that and then you can transition into different states so for instance state one or start can go here or it can go here depending on what kind of uh, variable changes we have that might be state one that might be state two and these states might do a little bit of work and then they might transition into say state 3 here for state 1 and state 2 might just go to state 2 and just end there. It might just loop forever in state 2. That would be like a waiting state or a done state. So maybe when state 3 is done getting its work done it goes here to state 2 as well. That's all well and good, right? But how do we actually implement this in Cordis? Well, we're going to see through the use of enumerations and uh, comparing to constants how we can make a finite state machine that does work here in the start and then transitions to a path that we want it to go to. So we can actually start doing some useful work in it. All right, welcome to Cordis once again. So here I've created a VHDL, and uh, it doesn't have anything in it right now. And what we're going to be doing is uh, creating a 16-bit counter. Now what that means is that this counter is going to look at the 16-bit input that's coming on it, and it's going to count out for every one on that input that it sees. So if it sees 16 ones, you'll get a hex value of F coming out. Or excuse me, 15 ones, you'll see a hex value of F coming out. Um, if you get uh, one bit coming in that's one, you'll only see one on the output. So let's get to work. All right, and we're going to use our library, IEEE, once again, and we want to start using this library, so we're going to use IEEE standard logic. 1164 is the big one that we all want, and we want to use everything that's in it. And we're also going to use a couple of other specialized libraries this time. So we're going to use IEEE standard logic, arithmetic all and this one's going to be used for uh, counting for our for loops set because we're going to use uh, for uh, integers integers for those who can spell uh, later on in this video we're also going to be using another library it's uh, the IEEE uh, unsigned logic library and this is going to be for converting back later. <laughs> okay, so let's make our four counter. So we need to make an entity. That's our four counter. 
and our entity is, we're going to create a port for it. And it'll have an input, and that'll be in standard logic. And since it's uh, more than one bit, it needs to be a vector, and this vector is going to be 16 bits wide, so it'll be 15 down to, down to 0. And we're also going to have an output. And it's going to be out, standard logic, a vector again, and this one's going to be 3 down to 0. Since we can count to 16 in uh, 4 bits, we only need uh, the 3 down there. And then we're also going to have a clock, which is going to be just single standard logic. Okay, now we need to define some behavior for it. So architecture, then behavior, and you can use whatever name you want to use for it. I just prefer behavior. It's important to make sure that those match up. <laughs> is and now we're going to define what we call a type. So this is what's going to be uh, what's going to allow us to define our finite state machine. So I'm going to create a couple of different states here. So I'll call this counter state is, and you can actually name these whatever you want them to. So I'm going to call uh, state 1 is going to be waiting, and state 2 is going to be working. So those will be when it's actually doing work and when it's just sitting there doing nothing. And then I'm also going to define a signal. And this is my state, and it'll be of the type counter state. So what this is doing right here is, uh, just like before when we would create signals, um, we might create them in uh, standard logic. Now I'm just using my enumeration, which is up here, my counter state, and I'm just creating a signal of that type. Now, what the signal is going to do is be persistent across different uh, changes of my VHDL file. So for instance, um, at time 0, if I'm in the waiting state, uh, it'll persist to time 1, it'll still be in the waiting state. Time 2, it'll still be in the waiting state until something changes and I put it into the working state. Otherwise, every time that time would occur in the VHDL file, what would happen is that it would always be in just an arbitrary state. Uh, so signals allow you to basically act as a memory and that persistence assist across um, multiple times that the VHDL instance is run. So I'm also going to create another signal here, um, and I'm going to call this counter out, and I'm going to use this later on for actually um, putting the value out to the output, but uh, it's going to be done internally, and you'll see why that is later. So this is going to be standard logic vector, 3 down to 0. Okay, and this is all done before the begin statement. So here we're just going to create a process, and our process is going to be sensitive to the clock. So in other words, whenever anything changes on that clock input line, that's when this process will kick off, and it'll actually do all this work here. But we're also going to create one more thing here. I'm going to create a variable, and I'm going to call this count, and this is a standard logic vector. It's going to be uh, 3 down to 0 again and I'm going to initialize him to be nothing. So that's hex right there of nothing. Okay, and a variable is a little bit different from a signal. A signal can be declared pretty much anywhere within the process block. So it can be declared in the architecture, in the process, in the BN, wherever you want. It, again, it's persistent across the um, VHDL instance. So every tick of time, that signal will be the same until you change it for whatever reason. A variable is a little bit different. A variable can only be declared within a process block itself. So right here we started our process, and right below it we've created our variable. And a variable acts as an instantaneous assignment. So if I want to change something, it's done immediately. Um, a signal does not do it that way. A signal takes time to change. So if, for instance, if I said signal, like my state, and I changed him to be uh, working, you wouldn't see that happen right away. Um, it would start out, and it would be in my state, and then the next clock, it would be in working. That's not so for a variable. If I did this with a variable, if I said count, you are now 10 or whatever, um, then it would be instantaneously 10. You're right there, done. No need to worry about it. So they're used for different purposes. Um, a variable is typically used within a process block to hold uh, numerical data, like integers, uh, floating points, if you have it set up for that, and so on and so forth. Um, so you can do a quick calculation and then put that onto a signal later on for assignment so that that signal persists across the modeling that we're doing. 
we're going to use count to act as the total number of uh, ones that we see on our 16-bit input. Okay, so here we go. We will now begin. So this is the beginning of our process block, and uh, we will now start doing sequential logic. Anything within a process block is going to be executed sequentially. So this is just like you're used to in uh, pr traditional programming languages. It'll go line by line. If it's outside of a process block, it gets executed concurrently. So for instance, if I have multiple of these processes all here in this architecture block, they all get executed at the same time, and uh, they just get executed depending on whatever's in here in this what we call a sensitivity list. So I could even have multiple processes be sensitive to the same thing. They could all be sensitive to the clock, for instance, um, but typically uh, processes that work on the same inputs can be frowned upon uh, depending on what they do. So um, it, it's usually a good practice to have uh, not so many processes that are dependent upon the same things in uh, a single architecture. Okay, so we're here uh, in this begin statement inside the process, and uh, so now we can start doing some sequential logic. So as we saw before last time, uh, we can create if statements. So I'm going to say if clock, and here's an attribute. Anytime you have a little tick right there, um, it's uh, going to be uh, what we call an attribute. And attributes give us access to uh, the actual um, underlying uh, object here, is a way of thinking about it. So we have a uh, event, we have high, we have low, um, these are all different attributes that we can use to do different things. So for instance, if I say clock event, that means that every time that clock changes, uh, this will be true. So in our earlier um, example there of where you have a, a clock coming in like this, awesome paint skills, um, then this would be a clock event, this would be a clock event, and so on and so forth. So it lets us know any time that we have a transition from high to low or low to high. But we also need to put something into our if statement to determine whether or not we're going from low to high or high to low. I like making rising edge things. Um, it seems to be kind of the, the standard in, in a lot of uh, designs. So we're going to say whenever we have a clock event and the clock goes to 1. So we're a rising edge. We've gone from 0 to 1 and we're now at 1. Then we're going to do some stuff. We also want to check what state we're in, because we started out and we're in waiting, and now we want to transition from waiting to something else. We want to start working, maybe. So if my state is waiting, and again, that's up here in the enumeration, like I said, you can just start using what you've written right there. So they're really convenient for doing finite state machines. So we've been waiting for a while, and now we want to start working. So we'll make my state working. And since it's a signal, we have to assign it by using the arrow and uh, equal sign there. Otherwise, so if we're not in the waiting state, notice that else isn't spelled E-L-S-E, it's just E-L-S. Um, but if we're not in the waiting state, then my state's got to be working, right? So, But we'll check it anyway. So otherwise, my state, if my state is equal to working, then I'm going to do some work. So let's initialize count. Uh, this isn't entirely necessary, but I like to be um, strict about these things. So I'm going to make sure that count is 0. And now I'm going to create a for loop, because we want to count all the instances that we see a 1 on that bit field coming in. And excuse me, I lost my place here. Okay. So, uh, this is our syntax. We have for i. This can be any letter, any variable name. I could call it foo if I really want to, um, but it's just uh, what we're going to be using to count. So in input, and this is what our low is, so it's going to go from input low, which is the very beginning of the input. Again, that's a new attribute right there, to input high, and high is just the high end of the vector, so we'll start going from, this will start at bit 0, and it'll go to bit 16, and each time it's going to change i to go with that. And we have to tell it to loop, and so now we're going to create an if statement here. So if our input at i, so in other words we're referencing the vector at that point, this would be really, really similar to saying array I, if you're used to C++, that's basically how you could think about that. So if our input I is equal to 1, it's a single bit turned on at that, then we're going to start doing incrementing. So we're going to take our count, and we're going to add count plus 1. So that's another cool thing.